Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Jake Sewell of Bravehawk Forge. I first saw Jake and his work on Forged in Fire, Season 6, Episode 15, where he and three other makers squared off with their skills in the forge, culminating in a Nagamaki build, which we'll get to see. Jake's Bravehawk Forge specializes in some of the most sought-after tomahawks for camping, fighting, and throwing. And as a, and he has a solid lineup of outdoor and kitchen knives. Jake and Bravehawk is also the producer of the Texas Custom Knife Show in Conroe, Texas, a show that I will be attending in November, which I'm very much looking forward to. We'll talk all about how Jake got into making tomahawks and the Texas Custom Knife Show. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share the show with a friend. And also, as always, if you want to help support the show, you can do so on Patreon. Just head on over to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon and check out what we have to offer. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Jake, welcome to the show, sir. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, man. Oh, it's good to have you. Good to have you. Uh, so uh, I mentioned up front uh, that you've been on Forged in Fire, and that's an interesting thing we'll find out about. Uh, but it's it's only that's only uh, the surface of your uh, career in forging and in making cool edged things. And we'll find out all about that. But I, I want to find out just from the get go where you started and if this has been a lifelong passion, um, knives and building stuff. So my grandfather is the one that got me into blacksmithing. I was 12 when I went to my first HABA meeting, which is the Houston Area Blacksmiths Association. Um, I kind of took to it like a duck on water, and the guys in the association said that I had a skill, and I've been doing it ever since. I, shortly thereafter, I made my first knife. It was, I think, out of a horseshoe. I'm pretty sure I still have it around here somewhere, but it's uh, it's you know, a low class prison shank at best, but Hey, you know, I was 12. So. Well, what, what was it about? Uh, was it the, okay. I was a little pyro when I was 12 and I always loved knife. Was it the combination of fire and steel and all that? Like what, what, yeah, I mean, it, it's, I don't know how to explain the passion. Either you have it or you don't. I mean, I, I like making things with my hands. I do woodworking and all kinds of stuff. I've built a lot of furniture in my house. Um, I just have a passion for building stuff. I, I can't sit behind a desk all day. I need to work with my hands. So that has a lot to do with why I, why I do it as an adult. But I've always just enjoyed hammering on steel. It's great when you're a kid and you're frustrated and you're angry. You can hammer on. You can hammer out your feelings. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Well, so uh, so knives. I mean, you could you could go into a blacksmith shop and you could make endless uh, you know amount of hooks and tools and little doodads and things. Uh, but why was it knives? Uh, I mean, I was a young teenage boy. Who? What kind of boy doesn't like to have a knife? I mean, I like whittling on sticks and throwing them. My real thing was I'd make it and I'd throw it at stuff, trying to stick it in everything, and that got me into making throwing knives and now tomahawks. But um, it's it's just who doesn't like cutting things i've cut myself so many times i don't i don't even remember <laughs> i don't get stitches i just super glue it <laughs> <laughs> super glue it. that's what it was uh, invented for uh, my cool. mom sort of uh uh hit me to that and uh yeah that's that's my mom showed me that little trick i love that see my mom is a uh 30 year veteran of nursing she's a ceo now of a hospital here in the texas area but uh when i grew up it was are you bleeding can you stop the blood is your bone broken? Can you breathe? Okay, you're fine. Oh so that's I, I grew up in that you know rough and tumble childhood, and I had many a bottles of super glue. I have a scar on my eye. I've got all kinds of super glue scars. So <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Uh, my my dad was a physician. It was the same thing. You know, if we hurt ourselves, we'd go to our mom. She'd give us sympathy. Our dad would be like, "Nah, you're fine." <laughs> Can't, yeah, I have you, a you wouldn't believe what I saw today at the office, dude. I have a I have a he's just under two years old and I'm constantly trying to get my wife. He's fine. He's fine. He'll be okay. 
So yeah. it, it's, you know, it's the motherly thing. My mom was just different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So. Well, um, okay. So you, you were, okay. So you, you're learning how to, to forge your, you're 12 years old. I have a daughter who just turned 13. So I'm familiar with the age. Like, uh, at that age, you're either, uh, pretty responsible or horribly irresponsible. So uh, if they were handing you fire and, and these kind of implements, I'm, I'm sure you were on that side. But um, so when I went to your website and was checking out your work, it, there is a preponderance of tomahawks. Um, that really seems to be your bread and butter. Um, how, did, so yeah, how, did, my, how did that on happen? On my website, I mainly sell my tomahawks. All my custom knives are just people reaching out to me wanting to make knives. I make a lot of custom knives, but uh, my bread and butter is definitely the tomahawks. Um, I can make anything. I can make swords. I've made many swords for people in Canada and all over the country. Um, but tomahawks, I before I started my business, Brave Hawk Forge, I was looking into starting a company and you know knife makers are a dime a dozen meaning everybody makes a knife or most people make knives and i got in touch with my stepdad's friend dana turner he used to own um free uh, fort turner tomahawks in northern california he was wanting to essentially quit the business he was getting too old and wanted to sell all of his stuff and teach somebody how to do it so I bought all of his equipment, had him come down, stayed with me for a month, which having a house guest for a month that you don't know when you're, you know, just about to get married with your wife is kind of rough. But uh, it was it was an experience. I spent every day of every week, about eight hours a day in the forge, learning his method of making tomahawks. So we're talking 160 plus hours. And in that one month, I made about 60 or 70 tomahawks. So and I was talking to a friend of mine before I started the business, Richard Epting. He's out of College Station. Don't I can't think of the name of his uh, his company. I would I'd give him a shout out. But anyways, he was telling me, you know, everybody makes knives, but not everybody makes good tomahawks. And so I took that to heart. And now, you know, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back or anything, but there's only two companies in the United States that I really compete with as far as production and quality. So a lot of Smiths make tomahawks, but not a lot of Smiths make as many tomahawks as I do, especially like production models like I do. So. Well, what, what makes a good tomahawk and what's the difference between that and an ax? Okay. So I get this question all the time. What's the, what defines a tomahawk? And I looked it up. There's no like real definition. If you look it up, I look at it as a tomahawk is supposed to be lightweight, and um, it could be easily thrown. So if you go to like an ax place where they do all the ax throwing, those are your standard hatchets that you buy at Home Depot or Harbor Freight or whatever. They weigh about three to four pounds. All of my tomahawks that are thrown, even the ones with the hammerheads on the back, weigh under a pound and a half. My throwing tomahawks specifically weigh under a pound, handle and all. So, I mean, I can throw these things all day long and never get tired. And they're more accurate because of the weight distribution. So. Um, also another feature of tomahawks, I don't have one with me because the basically I sell them all. I have the only one I have is a pipe tomahawk, but is the friction fit. So rather than having the tomahawk go on the top and then wedging it, you do a friction fit on a tomahawk where if you break the handle, you can pop the head off, put a new handle on it, and you're back to work. So that's one other aspect of a tomahawk that I try to explain to people. So it's uh, so really the tomahawk um, head is the important part, obviously, and the haft is somewhat disposable. And so you might expect since you're throwing it or you're going into combat with it, uh, you might I expect broke, to break that. I personally have broken hundreds and my wife is the master of Robin Hood and handles. So she'll throw one and then throw another one and rob the hood and split the handle. And I'm like, well, now I got to replace that. Wow. Those are like eight bucks a piece. Right. So. <laughs> And, you know, when we do our shows, like the Texas Custom Knife Show that we do, we always have a um, tomahawk gun competition. So I have people come in, they pay $10 to play. They get five practice throws, which I can teach anybody to throw a tomahawk in five throws as long as they're not a complete moron. Let's be honest. <laughs> and then they get 10 throws for points. And then person with the highest score at the end of the day wins one of my tomahawks. So it's like a you pay $10, you might win a $120 tomahawk if you have any kind of skill. So. 
it's uh it's always a good fun and we only let those people throw one because they're notorious for hitting the handles and messing them up so so i'm gonna i'm gonna start uh practicing now uh but what Oh yeah, I, I want I want to go back. I want to I want to talk a little bit about uh, tomahawks and 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 what. Um, well, first of all, why uh, this day and age? Why do people? Because I have a bunch of them. I have a nice. I have a lot of uh, not a lot. I have a few really great tomahawks that I love, like this uh, this one right here. I have a, um, a spike hawk there. Uh, from Elmer Roosh, and I, I prize it. I love tomahawks, and and you're right. To me, they're light, they're fast, they're for fighting, and, and secondary kind of tools. Um, yes, to me, uh, but 100. percent And that's what okay. I tell people. It's it's uh, if you're wanting to buy a tomahawk to chop wood, you're you're looking for the wrong tool. I mean, plain and simple. You can make you can use it for like kindling and stuff, especially like the camp style tomahawks that I make. Uh, with the hammerhead on the back, you can drive your tent stakes. They're lighter, so they're easier to carry in a you know in an outdoor bag. Um, but as far as chopping down trees and stuff, or you know chopping big branches, it's not made for that. It's made for like you said, lightweight, fast work. So uh, yeah, and and I noticed you offer a spike hawk, and I'm a big sucker for a spike hawk. Um, and so I offer, I offer a couple different versions of them. So, <laughs> Oh, you do. Oh, tell me about them. So I have four base models for my Tomahawks. I have the Valkyrie, which is a Norse design. I have the, um, uh, well, Buck Tomahawk, which is a like frontier 17th century design, a Francesca Tomahawk, which is a fourth, a fourth century Frankish design. Hmm. And then the Iroquois, which is like an 18th century, sixth, 17th to 18th century, um northeastern you know iroquois nation style tomahawk um for the spikes i offer the rogers rangers which is you know if anybody knows any history about the united states uh lieutenant colonel roger robert rogers probably butchering that i'm sorry um was in the revolutionary war and he revolutionized the guerrilla warfare for the united states so and they used tomahawk so he designed a tomahawk after him and it's uh it's one of my favorites it's under the spike talks the rogers rangers are and then i offer you know a valkyrie spike talk and an iroquois spike talk just because it's uh you know they're they're cool designs and they look cool especially with a spike on yeah, yeah. You know, the spike <laughs> is a uh, a feature that i love like um part of me you know imagines this as a as a combat weapon um, it would be a great way to shock and breach, you know, breach helmets and breach armor and that kind of thing. Um, and then you turn it around, and you throw it. But but if you're throwing it, it seems like the spike can also stick. Is that right? I'm not much of a thrower. Uh, I can I can throw knives a little bit. So in the proper hands, yes, the uh, spike can stick. And uh, you just got to know how to throw it because since it doesn't have so much cutting surface, you have to pretty much stick it at a 90 degree angle in the target, which, you know. Like I said, the proper hands with training, you can do it. And as far as the the helmet breach, my predecessor, Dana Turner, sold a lot to the military. I sell a lot to the military. And uh, they've been battle proven to go through a Kevlar helmet. So despite really? Yeah. And I, you know, I keep trying to get all these Rangers and stuff to buy them from me to, you know, take a video or something. Come on, do, do something cool for me so I can promote it. Um, obviously, I don't really don't want to put like blood and guts all over my website but right, it, right. i want the video for myself because i think it'd be cool but um i've smashed my rogers my personal rogers rangers in the concrete with the spike and chipped away the concrete and had no damage to the spike so that's it's it's a formidable weapon let's just say that so but, but weapon, weapon being the the key term because a lot of uh i feel like tomahawks became popular recently recently meaning like say in the last eight years or something 10 years uh from or maybe even longer actually uh due to all the military action we had going on in the middle east a lot of people breaching doors and and uh vehicles with uh like rmj tomahawks big full tang slabs uh though though thin and beautiful you know they're 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 kind of different from a tomahawk in that uh, they are heavy and large and you can pry and breach and do different different things than you would say with what you make. Yeah, agreed. 
Um, like I said, it's a light weapon, but in close quarters combat in the right hands, it's a, a very deadly weapon. And I have video of uh, Doug Markaida using mine, and he'll actually be at our show again this year at the Texas Custom Knife Show. Um, I presented him with one of my first full frame tomahawks. It's a little bit heavier, but it's more of a, it's specifically made for battle. Yeah. And uh, it's it's not really much of a thrower. It's, it's I call it the Reaper is what it's called. And I'm pretty sure I do somewhere. I think I have one left from that batch that I made, but uh, I gave it to Doug Markaida and watching him use that thing was impressive and scary because <laughs> he is a martial arts weapons master so oh no doubt uh, yeah. no doubt about that and don't don't get me wrong I, I think the rmj would would probably make an amazing weapon but it is heavy it is meant for to me it's it's you could almost call it like a battle axe because it's kind of meant for something a little more different uh yours is anti-personnel this is uh, one of those is a little bit more more of a t prying tool or something i don't know break down the door kind of thing. break down the, yes break exactly that's the hole in a wall so you don't have to use the door kind of thing so so how did it come to pass that you came on to forged in fire and uh you know how did that come about well when i first started my business in 2018 you know me and my wife religiously watched the show and i was like oh i'll wait a couple of years you know i'll get really good you know get the business going really good and uh then i'll apply and then i watched an episode where they made railroad spike knives I've made hundreds of railroad spike knives. And I was like, I could have done that way better, you know, the cocky blacksmith. And then I think of another episode shortly after that was Tomahawks. I was like, I'm, I'm applying because if they're doing stuff like this, this is in my wheelhouse. And uh, I applied and went through the whole interview process. They picked me and then was waiting and waiting and waiting. And then finally, you know, I needed the I needed the advance notice before I could go on because I have a regular job, too. And they called me on a Wednesday and was like, hey, we had a Smith drop out. Can you come on Saturday? Yeah. Now, mind you, this was the first year of the Texas Custom Knife Show. I wasn't affiliated with it yet as far as hosting it, but I was already paid up and was going to the show. It was my first time doing the tomahawk throwing. I had invested a lot of money and I was like, you know, I asked my wife, like, look, this is an opportunity. Are you going to be able to handle the show by yourself? I can help you set up and stay for a couple of hours, but then I got to fly out around noon. And that's exactly what I did. So it was one of the best decisions I ever made. So I loved it. It was awesome. I made a lot of good friends from it. Uh, Kyle Reese was on my episode with Meltdown Forging Company. Uh, he's one of my best friends. He comes down once a year to my show and stays with us. And we we all talk, we buy their kids stuff. We we're like a family. So it's what was good. that? What was that interview process like? So you have to fill out a questionnaire and then we do a Skype interview, kind of like, you know, like any Skype interview. Um, you have to present X amount of things that uh, you have forged, including something of greater than 15 inches, I think was what the, one of the requirements was. Um, background checks, stuff like that, I believe. Uh, it's been five years, so I forget, but um, it was it wasn't too difficult. I mean, if you if you're a bladesmith and you think you want to get on there, they're always looking for fresh meat. So, <laughs> yeah, I was yeah, curious I was how they could they assess your work. work. I, I mean, in all honesty, oh, I've got that blade on here. So I hadn't made anything really 15 inches or greater yet. So now, mind you, this has been sitting in my office forever and rusted. So I made this mini mini little pirate sword nice. and i did like a a snake guard on it it was really rough but like i said i kind of rushed it so that i could get it for the episode um and i just showed them this and was like look i have forged something this big and i i have the capability to do it and all on in all honesty this looks better than some of the stuff that comes out on the show man i'm not even gonna lie <laughs> those time restraints are no joke <laughs> So you got on the show and, and it was kind of an exciting um, kind of spur of the moment thing. Um, but uh, it explained, kind of describe the experience um, because uh, my wife and I have been uh, loyal watchers forever also. And, um, you know, sometimes we'll catch ourselves saying, you know, quench in water. Like, have you never watched the show before? 
you know um so but what's it like working uh under those constraints it looks like a very nice forage it looks like you've got all sorts of materials at your at your uh at your um reach uh but what what is that experience like so it's it's always different working in somebody else's forge you don't know where anything is and that's like a big thing like my Right now, my forge is a hot mess, but it's a chaotic mess. Then I know where most things are. So, and I know the capabilities that I can do in my forge with the tools that I have. Being on the show was surreal because, you know, once that, everybody always asks me, do they ever stop the clock? No, once that clock starts, it does not stop. And you're kind of running around your other smiths that you're competing with. But what people don't see is the camera crew, you know, the production staff that you're trying to step around. And then right when you're about to quench your blade. And I think even on my episode, I was going to quench and he's he comes up to start talking to me. And I was like, I'm about to quench, get out of my face or something like that. And he's all like, no, we, we want to talk to you about it right now. Like, what are you doing? You know, tell us what you're doing. I'm all like, well, I'm quenching the blade. This is crucial. Please get out of here. <laughs> like, distracting me. So um, it's, it's surreal. I mean, we spent a lot of time in a big wooden box on, called the green room. You know what I mean? Yeah. We can't yeah. see what's going on on set. Uh, so we spent a lot, spent a lot of time in there and all the Smiths had signed their names. There's the whole walls. They're all plywood and everybody's written on there on their forge and where they're from. So, and we, I, that's when I got a lot of opportunity to, you know, talk with the other Smiths and we all bounce ideas off each other and uh, got to know the guys. So it, yeah, we're in competition against each other, but, it's one thing about the blacksmithing community is we're all really tight knit. So when we meet somebody like-minded like us, crazy enough to stand out in 105 degree temperature with a 2000 degree forge on and just sit there and sweat and get burnt and cut and all that stuff, you know, great minds think alike and, you know, they, they attract to each other. So it, it was great. On, on your remember. episode, they uh, uncovered a big stack for that first uh, round they uncovered a big stack of exercise equipment and you had to use uh you know uh, salvaged barbells and that kind of thing uh to make your knives it is that a legitimate way uh in your opinion i mean i know you can make a knife out of a lot of different things but uh you know is this how you came up is this what people do uh before they uh can afford to buy the steel from new Jer new jersey knife bear and that kind of thing Yes, yeah, so one hundred percent. I was a steel. I was a steel scavenger for for years. I went to the scrap metal yard, pretty much until I started my company. I would just buy, you know, I would buy axles and leaf springs and uh, a lot of a lot of like coil springs. Uh, I've still got a bunch of like railroad coil springs that I use all the time still to this day. Um, you just got to know what you're looking for. I mean, not all steel is hardenable and if you know what you're looking for and you have it kind of an idea of, okay, well, that's, that's made to hold a lot of weight and be strong, or that's supposed to have some spring to it. Then you kind of get an idea of what the steel is made of and what it can be capable of. So, um, well, go ahead, sorry. so, but so when you're on that show and, and they do something like that, obviously you got to roll with those punches. Those are not ideal uh, circumstances. And that's the whole point to see how you adapt Yes. And, and, uh, I'm so in the guys that get to do like the stacked layer Damascus and, oh, you have to do a twist pattern Damascus in three hours. I teach classes and my Damascus class is a twist pattern Damascus class. So I can stack a billet myself and twist it and do all that stuff in no time. If I, if I can teach somebody to do it, I can do it like three times as fast as them. So, um, I'm always envious of those guys. Canister Damascus is a, a trick, but it's not impossible. Um, I've done quite a few and enjoy doing them. It, they make some beautiful patterns. This this pipe tomahawk that I made here is actually canister ball bearing Damascus. I don't know if you can see the, oh yeah, you can kind of see the pattern in there. Um, this is a canister ball bearing pattern Damascus. So what drives me crazy about the show, you mentioned it when we first started talking about Forge and Fires. Have you ever watched the show? You're coming on here and you've never done that? Like you've, you've never done a canister or you've never done this type of Damascus like what what are you thinking you're applying to be on the, a competition show that's supposed to be extremely hard yeah you know, it, it drives me and my wife do the same thing we're like what are you thinking so I, I, I have never uh, made uh, a canister billet before I've never forged a knife but I I know 
how I would do it. Like I've, I've never welded before, but I know how I would do it. And I certainly wouldn't use a, a, a white out, you know, and I would. Now uh, you can use white out. I use white out all the time on my canisters and they peel just fine. You just have to be patient enough to let it dry. Yeah. That's the, thing. that's what it was. That <laughs> clock never stops ticking. So people are like, Oh, I got to put the powder in there. It's not dry yet. Just let it chill. Cause yeah. the thing is, if you can put that white out in there and peel that can off and, five, 10 minutes, like I do in the shop here, no big deal. It, it's real quick. But as soon as you get impatient, it's, it becomes very difficult, very quick. So patience is key. <laughs> and it's so hard to be patient when you see that clock running. I bet, oh, you know, everything in you wants to just sprint. So what's it like mm -hmm. testing? You know, obviously you're, you have a, a condensed period of time. You're not in your ideal situation. Um, but that's the whole point obviously uh so you're making a knife that is uh to your standards substandard but it's kind of everyone wants to see how good substandard can be in three hours basically so what was the knife like uh that for that first uh challenge and what was it like having it tested so i i got a little overzealous on the press i was making a straight back sax knife and i had to do a sand mai so i do sand mai with all my tomahawks so i'm really comfortable with it um I, the metal was a really thin on the outer layer for my mild steel um so that was something i was not used to i'm used to having equal thicknesses forge welds much easier so i had a little bit of like a, a oh crap moment this isn't welding right and i just fluxed it i dumped the whole thing of flux on there everybody laughed at me um but then I got overzealous with the press and made it really thin and very narrow, like from top to bottom for a chopper. We were going to be chopping into 45 pound plates. Now I was, I was always the last to go through testing, even in the final, uh, which I get it. I want to see the other guys break before mine does. So, um, my buddy, Kyle, his broke on the second or third. I, I just watched the episode the other day and I can't remember. I think it broke on the second or third. Or maybe it was the first, the first strike whenever Ben Abbott smashed the club into the back of his blade, where he forge welded his San Mai in the handle was created a stress fracture and broke the handle. So I only had to survive, you know, whatever his didn't survive. Um, so I was felt lucky. I felt bad for him because his blade was beautiful. And in all honesty, if his wouldn't have broke, he probably would have went to the final over mine just because they liked his more. And if they all perform the same because of the thinness of mine and it's supposed to be a chopper um, and the fact that it was narrow, they would have probably preferred his over mine. But it was lightweight and thin, lightweight blades are very strong if you do them right. So, And thin, lightweight blades are what everyone wants these days. I mean... Um at least from my perspective, there's been, there was a long period of time where everything was uh, very thick and overbuilt. Now people want thin and slicey. People want to cut again, which yeah. is nice. Um, uh, but uh, before we get off of Forged in Fire, uh, I, I want to ask you about making that Nagimaki. Can you show that off uh, yeah. like you did before Nagimaki, we started? Yeah, stand back a little bit. Yeah. So this was my Nagimaki for my episode. Uh, this was the second one that I made. I don't know if you can hear me and kind of yelling. Yeah. It's made from 1095 steel. It's got so much flex to it. I don't want to do it too much because I don't want to cut myself. And I haven't done anything to this blade and it'll still shave in the right spot. Uh, when I got it back, it still had fur from the hog in it. Uh -huh. But one thing they didn't really talk about or show, and I didn't get any extra credit for it, is I made a Mokumugane Damas um, with the uh, Mokumagane guard and uh Hibaki. So I didn't get any extra points like I thought I would, but uh, what's Mokumagane? Uh, Mokumagane is pretty much nickel copper uh Damascus. So it's oh. a Japanese uh, it's a Japanese method of pretty much forge welding nickel and copper together, and it makes a beautiful pattern like Damascus, and you can manipulate it just like you do to Manas uh, Damascus. So it's extra accents like that that make a blade to me so you said that you made two of them yeah so the first one i broke and they edited it to where it was like an accident but after the so the first day i had five hours i forged out the blade and had it ground 
um, I made it from W1 steel. And I was kind of hesitant about using that steel because I know it's super brittle. Well, when I heat treated it the next morning, it came out like a, a wave and it was bad. And I was like, I don't think I'm gonna be able to use this. And I said that, but they didn't put that on, on camera. I was like, let's go try it out. And I went over and tried it out on a limb and it snapped in half about six inches down. So I was like, well, crap, you know, here we go. So I just started another blade. And by the end of the day, I had that thing forged out. So that time, that time crunch is probably the reason I didn't win that episode because I didn't have enough time to do as much finish grinding as I wanted to on the blade and get it really looking as good as my competitors. So this was by far the largest thing you had made up until this point, correct? Yes, it was. So what was that like? Did you have to, uh, build, uh, I, I've seen some people take two forges and put them together. Exactly or... I, I had two gas forges, two burners each, uh, put them back to back and worked it in and out to get my heat even. Uh, now I actually have like a five burner forge, uh, gas burner forge that I stand up right whenever I'm heat treating a long blade like that. And uh, it works a lot better because gravity doesn't try and make your blade go like this. <laughs> right. If you're right. from the end and heat treating it that way. So uh, I learned lessons from doing all that. And I've actually made a customer out of Austin, Texas. He he saw the episode and requested that I make him a Nagamaki because he'd been wanting one and couldn't find anybody that would make one. I was like, well, look, I just made one. Here you go. And it was, I spent, instead of four days, 35 hours total, I spent, I want to say like nine months making that blade. Wow. And I had a mirror finish on it and had curly maple. He didn't want the uh, the Ito wrap or anything like that. He wanted it all natural wood, Texas wood. So uh, actually, this is I made this at the same time. It's all dusty because I haven't used it in a long time. Uh, obviously, I haven't finished it, but I made this at the same time. I was going to try and upsell him with a <laughs> with another little a little. Hey, look! I made another little mini sword just the same way. A little tonto for you. Um, Obviously, I still got to finish the handle and everything, but it had a mirror finish just like this right here. And on a 36 inch blade, that's hours and hours and hours of hand sanding. So, yeah, and giant Popeye forearms from just. Uh, but but this uh, this gentleman is a fool because uh, everyone knows that a Nagamaki needs a uh, a companion tanto you know to right well and i didn't i didn't even offer it because i didn't have time to finish it i was uh if i if i finished it and hit him up he'd probably be all over it so, uh, and, and this probably goes without saying but sir if you are listening of course you are a gangster that's awesome everyone every household needs a nagamaki um oh, yeah. and I'm, I'm glad that he he got on that so um this how, how would you say that being on forged in fire um uh, helped your career or affected your career, I guess is the way I want to put it. So the show airing has helped my career uh, or the business because people liked my work and got, got an opportunity to see me that they normally wouldn't find me. So I have people still to this day that, Hey, I just watched your episode. I'm, I want to buy something from you. So, I mean, even now that it's on like Netflix or Hulu or, you know, all these streaming, I, I still get, business from it it's not as much as whenever it first aired when it first aired i had an influx of orders when i was like yeah so and at that point i was in business for just about a year so it, it really helped my business make leaps and bounds rather than the slow route so it was very beneficial for my company so were people asking you for swords or knives or tomahawks uh people normally go on the website and see what i'm good at I mean, I like to say I'm good at it all, but uh, they see what I make the most of and Tomahawks is up there. But I've had I've made a, a rapier for a customer, a broadsword for a customer out of Canada. That same customer has purchased like, I don't know how many items for me, two Tomahawks and a broadsword. Uh, it's it's pretty impressive. So. I've made countless items from ranging from war hammers. This is this is actually a war hammer that I, oh, that I uh, with. So 
so cool. coming out i'm coming out with a line of these on my website it's going to be a little different rather than the pointy needle spike it's going to have a uh more of like a it's going to be more like a how to like a dagger style point on the back of it but you know this is yet again another battle weapon this isn't made for driving nails that's for sure this is made for ending fools and then, okay let me just say jake uh i am so excited to see someone we, we we have an increasing amount of tomahawk makers out there which warms the cockles of my heart but to see you making a warhammer i love warhammers and there's only one reasonable warhammer on the market you know that's not like a a medieval sort of re repro uh and it's cold steel's warhammer and it comes and goes out of print and i have it but uh, i love that that you're planning on doing that i think that's awesome well, i plan on having some available at the show so when you oh, come down you can stop right by my booth right on so. and then uh, i also wanted to say that just in looking at your website uh, it seems like your tomahawks it seems like you can produce a good number of them and that they're reasonably priced so if you are someone who throws um it i don't i am not but it seems like you would probably want a couple of tomahawks at once so you're not walking back and forth a million times uh to the target you might want three or four in your in your belt and it seems like the way you make them um uh that's that's doable and if you split it like your wife you know right down the haft you can buy a new one off your site yep we sell all the handles and everything so um we do like to keep our prices reasonable i mean obviously the more you want the more it costs so like we do we offer metal engraving and all kinds of stuff which ups the price a little bit because i gotta put more time into it but i make tomahawks in batches so like when i'm making a custom knife unless i'm making a pair i start on that knife and it takes me a while to finish it right but tomahawks i'll start 10 tomahawks at the same time and i'll forge them out get them all forged out get them all ground out to the shape that i want and then heat treat 10 of them at the same time so that keeps my cost per unit down because it keeps my hours per unit down and it's you know it's a manufacturing mindset i don't want i don't want them to be stamped out on a machine because they're hand forged tomahawks but i gotta try and think like a machine in order to make good business you know what i mean it's it's a sometimes I'll make a single tomahawk if I'm running late or if I break one in the heat treat. If the heat treat doesn't go right, I can make one in about four hours from start to finish. Now, for a batch of 10, I can make 10 tomahawks in about an eight hour period. So, from start to finish. And that's, you know, I break that up into two hours this day, two hours that day, four hours this day, whenever I have the time. Because I do have a full time job, a wife and a kid, and I got to try and put a balancing act. So, um, but I can make about 10 in eight hours, depending on their level of complexity. So this whole experience and, and then starting the business has led to, um, your, uh, participation in the Texas custom knife show. And, uh, it's a pretty interesting show. I'm very excited about it. Uh, tell me about the birth of that show, kind of how it started and, um, and what it's going to be like this year. So Mike Thomas, my partner, the co-host of the Texas Custom Knife Show, and a guy named Guy Harris, who was actually on the pilot episode of Fortune Fire. Uh, he's passed away. Uh, he passed away a couple years back. But him and Mike got together, Guy Harris and Mike, and started the first show. And they had it at the Lone Star Pavilion where we're having it this year. Um, and it went pretty good. I mean, for the first show, it was it was a pretty good turnout. And then the next year I got with Mike and was like, Hey, I you know, I want to sign up for your show. He's like, well, I'm not doing it this year. Me and guy kind of had a falling out and I don't, you know, I'm not a knife maker. I don't know the people. So I was like, dude, I'm your guy. I got you. Let's do this together. And that was shoot five years ago. And we've been doing it every year, ever since. So, um, we've been doing it at Southern star brewery, who is a big time sponsor of ours, uh, here in Conroe which is always great, you know, sharp, uh, sharp things and alcohol. Uh, but they gave us their, they gave us their big field with the stage and everything free of charge. And obviously they made money cause they had beer sales, but uh, we kind of outgrew the, the field. And last year we had a bad, a bit of uh, bad luck with weather. Doug Markita came out and it was about 40 degrees and raining. So we had to 
<laughs> we had to seriously reconsider, okay, well, we got to protect people from the rain so that all these makers don't come out and uh, don't sell anything because nobody's here. Right. Um, right. So we went back to the pavilion, which it's a big, it's outdoors still, but it's a big, you know, arena style pavilion where they have like livestock shows and stuff. Um, and we're really excited about it this year because we've got Doug Markita coming back. Uh, he's going to be doing meet and greets. Uh, he's going to do blade testing. And uh, he's also, we're, we're in talks of him doing some of his Kali martial arts on Sunday, like a demonstration so that he can promote his other business, you know, not just Forge and Fire, but he has a martial arts business and he can demonstrate with some of his people and that'll be awesome. But we also have Jay Nielsen come. Last year, Jay Nielsen made a surprise visit and a very select pe few people knew that he was coming. And uh, I knew like the day before, because somebody was like, oh, I have a secret. And I was like, it's Jay, isn't it? Because I had saw posts about him being in Texas and I knew him and Doug are buddies. So I was like, I figured it out. And, uh, but with him coming, I got an opportunity to invite him to next year or this year's show and he's coming out. So, uh, it's super exciting because not only are they going to be there, but they're going to be, um, testing our blades annually. We have a knife build competition where I have three to four Smiths compete like they do on the show. And each year we up the ante. And last year, Don Halter with Crag Axe Armory out of Houston, Texas, was our winner. And he got this huge wrestling belt because I try and, you know, I try and get him a cool reward for winning. And, uh, man, I got him the coolest wrestling belt in every show he's gone to. He's worn it over his shoulder or <laughs> you know, like walked around. He's, you can't have it. You know, he's, he's getting all crazy with it. So, um, the belt, a new belt is going to be up for grabs this year. And I got four Smiths, three of my veterans, all on Forge and Fire, some of them champs, some of them finalists. And then all three of these Smiths have either won at our show or have competed in our show. I'm sorry, all of them have won at least one year. Now, my fourth guy is a newcomer. So he's my underdog. And I'm going to promote him like that. His name's Corey Yates. Uh, can't think of it. It's Ministries. <laughs> I'd have to look it up. But uh he's coming in as my, as my underdog trying to take out the big dogs so it's going to be a good promotion and it's, it's going to be a lot of fun so. so that's the the uh blade making competition uh a lot like fortune fire but I, I as i understand the uh they'll be starting with billets already made they're not starting from you know so that it's not a full eight hour uh event yes. So in past years, uh, for like two or three years, we had to make railroad spike knives. So we got to be realistic. We only have so much time in the day, and we can't draw it out to two days because people aren't going to want to come two days most of the time. Only the true fans will. So we try and keep it into a four-hour window. This year, they have three and a half hours. I was provided steel from Texas Knife Maker Supply here in Houston. Um, they provided me with two bars of 1080 and two bars of 15 and 20. With those two bars, I created four billets of 139 layer Damascus. So I left them, I left the billets thick at about a half inch and they're about 10 inches long, or eight or 10 inches long. Um, depends on who, which lady you're talking to. Um, so, uh, so the Smiths will have the opportunity to do whatever kind of pattern manipulation they want. They can do a ladder pattern or a, a raindrop pattern or you know some of these smiths are very creative and they can figure out what you know rather quickly what they're going to do with it so it's pretty exciting to watch them do that well that'll be uh that'll be cool to see uh, knives come i mean you know if you've watched the show and and you enjoy that process it'll be cool to see it live in a somewhat condensed uh, version but you know we didn't say this up front um but this show has an obvious uh, the texas custom knife show has an obvious link to forged in fire is that an official kind of uh thing is that how it started or what unfortunately no um we actually were in talks with the production cast of forged in fire this year because we were trying to get them on board as a partner slash sponsor um we actually if you look through our website nowhere on our website does it say fortune fire because of legalities, they finally, Fortune Fire finally came through and, you know, copyrighted their, their slogan or their, their, I guess their brand. 
So we had to scrub our website of everything that said Forge and Fire website and Facebook uh, or social media in general. So well, there's no affiliation except for Doug and Jay, but they're doing it on their own time on the mm -hmm. side. So it's, you know, it's, we can't really, you know, it's a, it's a gray line. Yeah, so I, we I, say I, Forge and Fire all the time. We talk about it and they can't keep me from talking about it, but I can't post anything like their sponsors or anything like that. So, well, actually the, the real reason I asked that question is because um, I love blade show. I love knife knife shows in general. And, and I, I love knives and a lot of my viewers love folders also. So is there, uh, does the custom, uh, Texas custom knife show, does it have a, a range of makers or is it uh, just a forgers or how's that uh, playing out? So right now we're at about 35 working towards 40. Um, uh, it's kind of my responsibility to get knife makers and with my full-time job and everything, it's difficult. Uh, some of these bladesmiths are very big on procrastinating. Um, but yeah, we have a range of makers that make everything. So uh, we've got guys that specialize in folders, guys that specialize in eat everyday carry knives and guys that specialize in swords and all kinds of stuff. So it's, it's a very good show and a very big show with a lot of variety. So we're working on getting up to that blade level, but, Wow. Yeah, that's that's a big show. I've yet to go to Blade. Um, I'm actually going to be testing for my ABS Journeyman's license uh, at my show. I'll do the uh, the performance test at my show, and then the following year, I'll probably be going to Blade to uh, do my my review of the three knives that I have to submit to get my Journeyman's license. Oh, it, it's it's a cool uh, experience. I mean, I haven't done the journeyman, obviously, uh, but being there is a is a cool experience. Uh, amazing, I love it. It's a lot of fun. But it's it it it, and I haven't been to the Texas Custom Knife Show yet. But it seems like it's a different vibe, and and uh, and you know, Blade Show is Blade Show. But you go to you go to other shows like I used to love to go to the New York Custom Knife Show when I lived in New York, and then it moved to Jersey, and then it moved to tennessee and it's like why are we still calling it this uh but the new york custom knife show i used to like to go to for the reason that it was uh you know it was in a ballroom of a hotel in times square for years and years it was not a huge show but it was mm, it, it was select it had a lot of really uh great stuff to look at I, in those days i could only look at it um yeah but uh, yeah, so that that's kind of something that's very appealing to me about this show and what I know about it so far. The Texas Custom Knife Show is the uh, uh, well, uh, the the knife uh, the uh, knife and axe throwing contest, the forging contest, all the sort of interactive uh, stuff. And I know that that exists at Blade Show, but it's so huge and overwhelming that stuff gets buried unless you're there specifically for that. So it it's not a small town vibe exactly, but it's uh you know all the guys that are coming I I've talked to personally. So you know Blade Blade Show from what I hear is very uh very like you said overwhelming, but it's also very corporate. So I this is where I, you know me and my partner he wants to make it more corporate, and I'm like no we need to keep it family oriented and you know and that's we we that we balance each other out so um it, it it is very small time not small time i shouldn't say that it's uh very humbling and awesome to be with all these people because i mean when i get there i'm going to be cracking jokes and making fun of jonathan sibley who's you know one of my good buddies from east texas and i'll be cracking jokes with another guy and uh everybody gets you know the people that come to the show get to see that and the camaraderie that we have and they always enjoy it so and we have customers come back annually every year from the same you know they're out of willis or they're here in conroe and they come every year we come every year because we love to watch the show and you know it's it's fun so i've spoken to a lot of knife makers in texas what it, what is it about texas uh that why am i speaking to so many of you guys coming from there you know i'm not sure uh texas has also had the most contestants on forge and fire um by by landslide from my last check um i don't know maybe we're all just crazy and <laughs> we like we like weapons obviously so 
I think there's something about the independent. Uh, it seems independently minded. I don't know if that's real or home not. But Bowie knife. what's that? I said home of the Bowie knife. I, I have no idea. <laughs> right now, you got to understand. I'm I'm talking to you from right outside DC. So everywhere else seems uh, a, a little bit cooler. <laughs> but but <laughs> yeah, free. But uh, yeah, Texas uh, definitely. Uh, pushes that so we were we were talking before you mentioned your wife and how she is a part of your business how does how does she integrate in so when we first started my wife was in the shop with me uh that woman can grind a tomahawk and she is like the best apprentice i've ever had in my life and i'm not just saying that because she sleeps next to me and probably stabbed me in my sleep um she just she's real good about doing what i ask her and she does it and i don't have to tell her twice and you know, I've had some other apprentices that younger kids, I've got to tell them how to do it multiple times. And that annoys me. I have short views for that kind of thing. Um, but she just, she would help out in there. And then we had our son. So she doesn't get to hang out in the shop anymore. She brings them out every now and again, but she also runs the books. So she runs the, the number side of our business, which is great because I can do math really well, but I ain't trying to cook, you know, I'd be cooking the books left and right. So. <laughs> The government would think I didn't make any money. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, obviously men and women go well together, obviously. But uh, I've heard a lot of knife makers talking about how their families work into the business. And it always seems like um, the knife maker's wife and and I'm no knife maker. And this is how it works in my household, too. But, you know, there's a certain attention to detail that women have uh, 100%. naturally that that um will uh, I, I, you know for lack of a of a uh, of a long explanation it will make your business better because she's going to see the things and think of the things that you're not because you're thinking about how cool tomahawks are and how you're going to make an even better one and how you got to make eight of them in the next 10 hours and and all of that and she's going to be thinking about the stuff that's going to keep your business going and, and she's obviously she's actually my she's my quality control. So all of my tomahawks are viewed by her. So she, you know, if I miss a flaw or, you know, if I'm like, Hey, can you tell that this is, I mean, this, this little, can you tell about this little issue right here? And she's like, well, not really. If, if you wouldn't have pointed it out, I wouldn't have known. I'm like, well, it's driving me nuts. So she's, she balances me out on my want to be perfect. And also, Hey, you mess this up. You got to fix it before we ship it out. Oh, I didn't even notice that. Thank you. And then sometimes I'm like, babe, come on, but that's nothing. Why are you busting my balls about that? You know, it, it works out. So she has a great eye for detail and I couldn't do it without her. Uh, could she throw also? She's, Oh, you oh, mentioned she's that. A yeah. Dead eye. yeah. Damn. She, me and my best friend, we, uh, we'll play here and drink a bunch of beer. Uh, he would always beat him and he gets so mad. I mean, I always beat him, but every once in a while I let him win so he wouldn't get so mad. But he's super competitive and she had just spanked him up and down the, the tomahawk throwing course I have in the backyard and he would be so pissed about it. She's like, well, shouldn't suck because she's very competitive too. So, so uh, how do you see um, Brave Hawk Forge growing? What or, or how do you see it in the future? What, what do you want the company to be like in 10 years? So in 10 years, my son's going to be old enough to be in the shop. And, uh, you know, I grew up with house chores and uh, all that stuff and didn't get an allowance as part of my room and board. So my son's going to have the same thing. He's going to have house chores and stuff in the house, but I'm going to try and teach him if you work, you get paid. So he's going to work in the shop and either he's going to love it or he's going to hate it, but he's going to have to do it until he moves out of my house because it is a family business. And I hope I don't push him into it so much that he hates it. But right now he's, he's just under two years old. And every time he comes out there, he's wide eyed and wants to touch stuff. And I'm, I'm hoping that that sticks because I could use a little, little hand in the shop, especially to sweep up the floors and all the rust and stuff. So. I mean, I, I, I think you got him early and, and, and also he's a boy. So uh, knives, axes, that stuff comes naturally. Yeah, I've just got to keep him from chopping his fingers off. That's that's the only concern is that, him hurting that, himself really bad in the shop. So, but yeah. uh, I just I just see our business staying steady and growing, you know, small. And as my son gets older, we can expand the business more. 
um, make more product, be able to sell more. Like right now, I probably sell about 70 to 80 tomahawks a year. Um, and that's on the website. In, in, in person, we probably sell about 40 or 50 uh, at shows. So if I can keep that going, that's a, you know, that's a good spot for me now, especially with how much I work and with the family and everything. So I just want him to get in there so he can help me <laughs> or her, him to get old enough to where he can play outside and she can come back and help me. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so what, what is the, what is the, I don't want to say tomahawk and I don't want to say knife, but what is the thing that you want to build that that's kind of your grail build uh, before you hang up your spurs? Oh man. That's a good question. I mean, I really, that's a really good question. I, I've made so many different types of things that I would love to make a, like a, name of that sword. Oh, I can't think of the name of sword. The, the one from Braveheart. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm having a brain fart. Claymore, is that what it's called? Claymore, thank you. I would love to make a Claymore because I just think it's a beast of a sword um, out of some sweet Damascus. And I always push myself. So, I, I mean, it's that'll change next year. You know, I, I'm constantly doing something new. Uh, it, it's how I stay passionate because after making so many tomahawks, it, it does lose its luster, let's say that. Um, so I'm always constantly making something new and trying something new out like the war hammer i'm i'm going to start i made two of them and now i'm going to make a line of them and see how they do on the website and if they stay good on the website then i'll put it permanently on the website but um it, it, it's really just down to what crazy thing i dream up next sometimes my wife's like you obsess over this and i do if i have an idea i have to put it on paper or i'll lay in bed at night and i won't sleep because i'm thinking about different designs you know, oh, I can take the Damascus and manipulate it this way and make this pattern. It's it's crazy. It's an obsession. So, well, uh, we're all glad you're obsessed on making tomahawks. Obsessed with making tomahawks. I mean, that's that's how it should be. And you keep us all, you know, in in this crazy hobby. What? Uh, how can people get in touch with you? How can people get your their hands on your work? Um, tell, tell people the best way to get in touch with you and that kind of thing. So you can visit us at bravehawkforge.com. You can hit us up at bravehawkforge at gmail.com. Uh, on our website is our phone number. I don't know it off the top of my head. You'll probably catch our answering machine, but we'll give you a call back. Uh, the best way to go about it is email us, Facebook, social media. We got Facebook, Instagram, and, uh, YouTube. I do have a YouTube channel. It's just not very... You know, I don't have a whole lot of stuff on it because it takes more time to edit a video than it does to make a video. And I don't have that kind of time. So, um, but yeah, just reach out and I'll make you whatever you want and within reason, within reason. Some people come up with some crazy ideas and I'm like, dude, you want a bubble level in the middle of your blade? What are you talking about? Like, no, I'm going to pass on it. <laughs> but those things within reason, I like to challenge myself. So if you have something crazy, hit me up. I'm more than willing to give it a try and I'll give you the best price I can on it. That's one thing I'm really happy about is I don't, I'm not at the level to where I can charge $2,500 for a four inch Damascus knife. You know, I, I feel like my stuff is quality, but those guys that have that, that prestige are at another level and uh, you'll get a high quality blade from me at a very fair price. So before we, before we get done with everything, I got to give some sponsorships shout outs. So I was told to be with uh, Mike. Okay, okay. Before, before we do, I was, I was just going to ask uh, to wrap that up too, and and tell people before you get to those uh, where people can find out more information about the Texas Custom Knife Show. How you know how best way to do that? Okay, so you can visit us on TexasCustomKnifeShow.com, uh, Facebook, Instagram, same thing, Texas Custom Knife Show. Um, we're really excited about the show. It's going to be November 4th and 5th at the Lone Star Pavilion in Conroe, Texas. Uh, it should be from 9 to 5, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. both days. 
Um, we are going to have a bladesmithing competition, tomahawk throwing competition. We are going to be having a live auction on Saturday, which benefits uh, Operation Red Wings, which is Marcus Luttrell's uh, foundation. It helps wounded soldiers get the help they need. And it's our fourth or fifth year pairing up with them. We're really happy to help them out. We've raised probably about $40,000 in the past couple of years to help them out in their, in their project. So we have a live auction and the blades that are made during our blade smithing competition are actually auctioned off. So not only do you get to watch the Smith make them, you get to watch Doug and Jay Nielsen test them, but I'm going to put them in a shadow box with the photo of the Smiths that made it and the two judges and I'm going to auction it off. So you can help us by raising money for, you know, Operation Red Wings. We will have, um, on Sunday, we're going to have Battleship. I'm sorry. We're going to have uh, Blade Sports there doing their Texas championship um, for, for their blade cutting. We'll have Doug Markaita doing his combat demonstration. Uh, Jay Nielsen will be doing a canister Damascus demonstration. Um, and we'll have some various other things going on throughout the day. Battleship Texas Foundation will be there both days. They're actually helping restore the Battleship Texas that is in dry dock right now in Galveston Harbor. Um, I'm part of that uh, effort. I, I'm got some steel from them, and I'm in the process of making a couple of blades to give to them for their auction at their gala next year. So you know, there's going to be a lot of stuff, and it's just going to be a fun, good time. So we hope everybody can visit us and come out and see us November fourth and fifth at the Lone Star Pavilion in Conroe, Texas, at the Texas Custom Knife Show. Nice. Oh, so nice. you wanted to mention some sponsors. So I got a couple sponsors here that are going to be helping out that have helped out with the uh, not only the show, but with the um, the bladesmithing competition. Sorry, I've got Cold Steel. Uh, they're they're one of our sponsors, Broadbreck Ironworks and Jant Supply, uh, Texas Knife Maker Supply, Clark Iron Forge Press. I'm probably brutalizing that. I'm sorry. Um, I should have written that one down. Anyways, we've got multiple sponsors and I don't have a full list here, but we will, uh, it's all on our website. Go to our sponsors page. Um, if you're looking to sponsor us, hit us up. We could always use more money. The more money we get, the more people we can get to come and the cooler the event can be. So uh, there's a there's a tab under our website that's labeled sponsors. So we're always looking for more sponsors. Well, that's great. Uh, Mike has got me very excited about it. And then speaking with you has got me even more uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And we have a lot of viewers and listeners in Texas. Um, I, I hope uh, over the next few weeks, next uh, couple of months, I'll be talking about it. I hope I see some of our fans there. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Jake, thank you so much. Jake Sewell of Bravehawk Forge. Thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you very much. I appreciate yes. it. It's been a pleasure. You too. All righty, sir. Take care. Ever visit the knives online in the hopes of satisfying your need to possess them in the real world? Then you have a problem. You are a knife junkie. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Jake Sewell of Bravehawk Forge. Uh, very much looking forward to meeting in person, meeting him in person, but also hefting his awesome tomahawks in person. I have my eye on the uh, spiked. It's the one, uh, the Northeast Iroquois style. Um, well. I have my eye on all of them. Uh, I am a tomahawk lover, just like I am a knife lover. I just have fewer of them. All right, ladies and gentlemen, be sure to join us again next Sunday for another great interview, another great knife personality right here. And then on Wednesday for the midweek supplemental, join us then Thursday for Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear 
hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. 